As many of you know, I just got back from a trip to San Francisco and Yosemite, and a quick visit to the Fremont factory, which was super, super cool. It's nice to pay pilgrimage. Anyway, along the way, obviously, the San Francisco is sort of the epicenter in Fremont, I guess is the epicenter of Tesla because, of course, that's where their factory is. It's where a lot of eco-conscious people are, etc. But what I noticed was, while driving around San Francisco in the area, I thought, wow, this is really cool that there's a lot of Teslas. But when driving through Yosemite and out in the country and, you know, the National Park, I actually, even driving another car, was super stressed about seeing all of the Teslas driving around there because I was worried about range anxiety. But then I realized something about that, and I thought I would do a video on it. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. So first I wanna say a little bit about going to Fremont. It was super, super cool to go there. I'll put in a little clip that I recorded right here. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. So uh, guess where I am? <laughs> it looks like I'm just gonna pay pilgrimage to all the Tesla factories this year. So been to Texas already, that's not working yet. But now we've got the Tesla factory in Fremont, the original, which is where my baby Tesla was made. The Y and Sexy was made right back there uh, back in December of 2020. So anyway, uh, just, you know, I wanted to do a tour here. Super sadly, um, because of COVID, they don't allow tours right now. So they've disallowed them. So I really was gonna try to get back and do the tour of that. But in the meantime, I just wanted to do a really quick thing. You can pan around. Hunter is my cameraman. Very pretty um, area around here. And not too far, what did it take us? About 50 minutes from San Francisco. So pretty close to San Francisco close to Silicon Valley. We're only uh, maybe 15 miles from San Jose. And uh, the weather's a lot nicer here than it was in San Francisco. It's much warmer. Yeah, actually, if it weren't for my uh, microphone, I would have taken off my jacket because it's not that cold. But one thing you can't see from this angle is this factory is really big too. It is uh, kind of shockingly large. It was very surprising to me because I knew that the Giga factory in Texas or Terra, Texas was going to be absolutely huge, but I didn't expect the Fremont factory be, to be quite as big as it is, but it's, been, it's very, very large. Uh, not too much else to say, unfortunately, like I said, since I'm unable to go into the factory and do the tour, that's all, you know, private road, authorized traffic only, so I'm sure we would get in trouble if we tried to go back there. So we're going to head on to Yosemite, but I just wanted to say a quick, you know, hi and shout out and thank you to Elon Musk day after your 50th birthday, so congratulations on that. And, uh, you know, here's to the next 50 years being awesome for you and for the Fremont factory becoming one of five soon, right? So we got Fremont, we've got Nevada, Texas, Shanghai, and um, Berlin. So yeah, this will be one of five soon right now. It's one of two plus the Nevada factory, which makes the batteries and so forth. But anyway, so very, very cool. Really neat to see. I don't know what they're building over there. If you pan around, it looks like housing. So I don't know if that's specifically Tesla housing or just housing in general, but you can see from the highway, I'll try to get some B-roll to put on here if possible, but from the highway, you can really see this is pretty crammed in space-wise. There's not a lot of space around it. So I think their advantage in places like Shanghai, uh, Berlin also, because it's a forest, and certainly in Texas, is they have a lot of room to grow there. This is not so much room. I think they've just kind of crammed it in as much as they can. Anyway, it was super cool to see the factory. It was very disappointing, of course, that they're not doing tours right now because of the whole pandemic thing, but oh well. <laughs> Hopefully I'll have a chance to come back. Maybe AI day. Uh, I keep hoping I'll get inv invited there for like something like that, but AI day would be the perfect day. So, so Tesla, if anybody's listening at Tesla, I would love to go to AI day. So invite me and I'll get there. But as I said in the intro, even though I see a lot of Teslas driving around Georgia and especially the Atlanta area. It was pretty crazy. There are a lot of Teslas in the San Francisco area. So again, you know, San Francisco, no big deal, very civilized. There's superchargers, people can charge at their houses, etc. But for the second half of our trip, we went to Yosemite National Park, which is about four and a half to five hours away from San Francisco, depending on traffic, etc. So anyway, it's not that far away. But as I looked around, of course, we were driving a gas car because we rented the car. It was a Volkswagen Touareg, which I thought was just a terrible car. I was actually super shocked. I We owned a Volkswagen Jetta, I think it's a 2001 that we purchased and we owned it for about 15 years. 
really, really good car. Loved that car. And it was a stick shift and the engine worked really well. And I just thought it was a very good car. The Touareg on the other hand felt like a toy and way too many buttons. And the gas engine was just atrociously bad. I, I was like, geez, Volkswagen, what is going on? So anyway, they got work to do. Maybe they've just transitioned everything over to electric and they're going whole hog on that and they don't care about their gas cars anymore that much, but it was not an impressive vehicle. But anyway, in order to get to Yosemite, you drive through some desert, and then you go up a really, really steep switchbacks, you know, up to, I think the highest pass around the area is over 6,000 feet, maybe 6,500 feet, or a couple thousand meters-ish. So anyway, it gets up from sea level, basically, up to a pretty high elevation. And of course, as you're going up in elevation and then down and everything, you're using your gas in a very different way, or your electricity, depending on what kind of car you're driving, uh, and so it made me really start to look around and think about that because I'm looking at a bunch of Tesla Model Ys, a bunch of Tesla Model 3s, I saw some Model S's and Model X's. But anyway, the range, you know, you start thinking about 300 miles-ish EPA range, but it's going to go way down as you're driving up these mountains. Now, of course, as opposed to a gas car, as you go down, you're going to regenerate braking, so you're going to actually save a lot of energy, potentially even recoup a little bit as you go down these big, you know, switchbacks and everything. But just for interest's sake, before we left for the trip to Yosemite, I looked around to see what kind of superchargers there were, and there are not very many choices around there. It's sort of like over an hour in any direction. There's sort of two of them and they're like over an hour away for either direction. So that's a lot of miles and it effectively, more importantly, it's a lot of elevation gain. So really, you know, as the crow flies, it's not that many miles, but you're doing this kind of thing going up, which uses a huge amount of power. The other thing was that we couldn't get a place in Yosemite Village. It's very, very crowded there. So we stayed in Wawona, which is only again, eight miles away as the crow flies, but it's a 25 mile drive from Yosemite Village because it's this kind of thing up and then down again. So it's a 25 mile drive that uses a lot of gas if you're driving a gas car and of course it would use a lot of electricity if you're driving a battery operated vehicle and what made me start to think about this was the fact that there are no gas stations in Yosemite National Park itself, except for the one at Wawona. I'm not sure if there's another one anywhere, but I think the other closest one is El Portal, which is outside, and then there's one at Groveland, which is a long drive. I think it took us an hour and a half to get from Wawona to, uh, to Groveland. And again, it's not necessarily the distance alone, it's the fact that you're going up and down all of these huge elevation gains, because Yosemite Valley itself is like, 3,000, 3,500 feet, something like that, but you get to over 6,000 feet as you go over these passes. So, you know, you're doing this crazy thing going up and down all the time. So you use a lot of gas to do this. If there hadn't been a gas station in Wawona, pretty close to where we were staying, it would have been a really, really big problem. And that's what started to make me think about this episode was that I was like, range anxiety is not an electric vehicle you know, monopoly, right? If we had range anxiety about our vehicles and we were very worried about it and that gas station was kind of a lifesaver because otherwise we would have had to go like on special trips to seek out gas from some place, right? We would have had to go look for it. So I was thinking about that, you know, I was like, okay, so if it hadn't been for that one particular gas station, we would have had to make extra trips out to do that because we did a lot of driving. We were, you know, going all over the place and looking at a lot of stuff and driving all over the place. So it would have, it would have required special trips and really, really special, careful, um, nurturing of the amount of gas that we were using at any particular place. So what I started thinking about was, okay, so I have range anxiety about driving the Tesla, but it's really much more about supply. I think the issue is that as that modern, you know, people living in developed countries for the most part, we've just gotten used to the fact that gas stations are all over the place. And I have had range anxiety, especially traveling out west, like you drive in Wyoming or something and they'll be like, you know, next gas 250 miles or something. And you get range anxiety about gasoline engines there too. So really it's not about the fact that gas engines somehow are magically better in terms of range. It all has to do with supply. It has to do with the fact that you can go to a lot of places and get gas. You can't right now go to a lot of places and get electricity. With the caveat that, of course, I'm sure people driving their Teslas in, if you're staying at a cabin or something like that, you can at least plug into the 120 volt uh, system and you can get some you know, range back overnight. So it may not be great, but if you're, if you're leaving your car, let's say, you know, you, if you leave it overnight, that's maybe 10 hours or something that it's there. So it could get 40 or 50 miles overnight. And that is a decent amount of range. And you can't get that with a gas engine in a national park, right? You can't 
you can't go, I guess you could bring along a can of gasoline with you or something, right? But uh, you can't do that. You can't just magically get something like that out of nothing in the national park area. So actually, in some ways, the supply of electricity is actually somewhat better in the national parks for electricity because all these cabins have electrical power. Whereas you don't have gas except for these very, very particular places in the national park. So again, you may be like, yeah, that's an artificial situation. But think about this. As time goes by, using Norway, which is now, what is it, 67% uh, only battery operated vehicles, right? That was their new car sales. Or again, using a place like San Francisco, where there are so many Teslas that are around that it indicates what's going to happen in the future. And that is that as battery electric vehicles, Teslas and other battery electric vehicles take over, and there's more and more and more of these, there are gonna be fewer and fewer gasoline powered cars. And at some point, gas stations in a lot of places are going to become economically unfeasible, right? They already operate on razor thin margins, and they basically, only care about the fact that that you're coming in to buy a soda or something like that because that's how they make their actual money but at some point a lot of these gas stations are going to start to go out of business or they'll just convert to superchargers or some other electrical charging station so that you can get charging so there's going to be kind of a flip of the coin at some point the supply for electrical is going to outstrip the supply for gas and at that point it's going to become very very stressful to drive a gas car anymore so anyway that's a really interesting takeaway from all of this is that right now people think oh EVs bad problems we've got issues with range and all of this stuff but in some ways EVs have a little bit more flexibility because electrical power is all over the place so even if you can only grab a 120 but you know again if a cabin you're staying at happens to have a dryer vent and you have a, a 240 volt plug you can stick that in too and so you can actually use that, that as well so there's more flexibility with electrical power supply you can get more power to more places because electricity is already going to most places, whereas gas requires, you know, physically shipping gas trucks to some place and filling up a thing, and it's environmentally toxic. So, you know, especially in national parks, they don't like to put in gas stations because it's very environmentally toxic. So there's very, very, you know, limited supply of that. But what's going to happen is in the world at large over time, there will be fewer and fewer and fewer gas stations, and there will be more and more and more charging stations. And, and the balance is going to switch. And at some point there's going to be adequate supply of electricity and people in the future will think about gasoline engines as range anxiety causing things because it will be hard to find a gas station, especially you know in those big stretches of like the United States or in the backwoods of any part of the world where you have to go a long ways to get to the next thing. At least most of these places still have electricity. So in a pinch, you can plug in and you can at least get some range. Whereas gas, if you don't have gas, you don't have gas. There's there's no way to fake that. So it's a really interesting thing to think about that range anxiety is not an EV thing. Range anxiety is a supply thing. And that's the takeaway from all of this. It's the fact that right now we think about a limited supply of electricity for charging these cars, which is a little bit false again, because there are a lot of options for charging electrical things. Whereas right now there's just a plethora of gas stations. And so we don't think about that as a problem, but it is a problem and it's going to become a bigger and bigger problem of supply. So there will come a time when it's going to become very difficult to drive a gas-powered car in many places in the world, and it will be much, much easier to drive an electrical-powered car, a BEV. And so that's going to happen, and it's something to think about, and it's something to, you know, in terms of stock market and, and the markets and all of that, if you think about energy companies or all of that sort of stuff, you need to think about the future and what's, what's the world going to be like in 10 years. And a lot of these very, very wealthy petroleum companies are not going to be doing as well in 10 years because the, the demand is not gonna be there, the supply is going to drop, and they're not going to have anything to produce this for. So they're going to have to turn to other things. So anyway, it's, you know, I'm not, again, a financial expert, do your own research, but it is interesting to think about all of the ramifications, not just for the public, right? The public eventually, maybe by 2030, 2035, the perception of range anxiety is going to switch to being about gas cars, not electric cars. And at the same time, all of these industries that make a ton of money on petroleum are going to be hurting at that point. So very, very interesting stuff that's going on here. I just wanted to talk about it quickly. As you can see behind me, we are definitely about to move. So it's gonna be chaotic this week, but I wanted to get out at least one video. So hopefully you find this kind of interesting. Anyway, stick with me. By next week, we're gonna be in the new studio. It'll be still blank, I'm sure, but it will be fun to be recording there. And in the meantime, 
if you do enjoy this video, please do like it because it helps YouTube's algorithm. And of course, consider subscribing for more of this. And of course, as always, a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon. You all are amazing. Thank you so much for sticking with me during this crazy time. I'll be back on board and doing things normally in about a week or so, so thank you. And for those of you interested in investing, check out Webull, an amazing platform for buying and selling stocks, and now cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and others. Open an account and get a free stock valued at up to $200, and fund your account and get another free stock valued at up to $1,600. Check out the link in the description and help the channel at the same time. Thank you. And don't forget about our merch store, which now has physics is the law, everything else is a recommendation, which is a quote by Elon Musk, as well as other t-shirts, mugs, tumblers, etc, etc. Check it out in the description. And finally, don't forget we are both Tesla and Amazon affiliates. If you look in the description, you can see how clicking on a link and going shopping helps the channel. Thank you. And as always, ask me questions in the comments or at my email address, which is drknowitallknows at gmail.com. Till next time, bye-bye.